Okay, uh, hi everybody. Uh, so again, I'm Aaron Blankstein, one of the core engineers at Blockstack, and I'm gonna be talking about a feature that um, we recently uh, released that helps deal with some scalability issues um, and cost issues when it comes to registering names on Blockstack. Okay, so uh, today, uh, Blockstack names, if you go and register a name on the browser, uh, that name will be a domain. So if I tell you that I am a blinkstein.id and you go and look that up, you see a profile for me um, right there, programmer and block stack activist. That works great. Um, however, um, let's see what this uh, actually looks like when you dig into uh, how the resolution occurs. So uh, domains are really just um, associated with a zone file. Uh, and a particular owner. So if I tell you that uh, I am a blinkstein.id, uh, what the Blockstack browser will do is it does a lookup and it returns a big chunk of code, um, which has things like uh, the actual owner address and a zone file. So the zone file here is uh, just a string of information that tells uh, the Blockstack browser how to resolve uh, my name into uh, that profile that you saw before. So the way that you end up with a domain today is you uh, register uh, in your Blockstack browser. This uh, browser communicates with a core node, and that core node issues uh, three Bitcoin transactions in order to register that name. So first, it issues a pre-order. Um, it waits uh, some amount of time for uh, that pre-order transaction to get confirmed by the network uh, to prevent certain attacks like front running. And then it issues two more transactions, a register transaction where it reveals the name that it's trying to register, and then an update transaction where it sends the network uh, the actual zone file uh, corresponding to the name. So uh, this works great, uh, but there are a couple problems uh, when it comes to uh, the user experience. So uh, the first problem is that uh, this whole process, um, in the best case, takes about six blocks to complete, which is uh, about one hour. So if you're trying to onboard users and your experience is, okay, um, send some money uh, to a wallet, uh, issue some transactions, and then wait an hour for uh, anything to be useful, um, it ends up being a sometimes hostile experience for users. The second problem that we have is that uh, this registration requires paying three transaction fees to get those transactions into the Bitcoin network, and then also a domain registration fee. Um, this works out to, uh, right now, about 0 .0086 Bitcoin, um, which is about $40. So if your onboarding experience uh, for users is uh, burn $40 and then wait an hour, and things might work out for you, um, you might have difficulty onboarding users. Okay, so what's the solution here? So uh, the solution that we've come up with is uh, subdomains. So in a subdomain world, I would tell you that I am Aaron.blinkstein.id, and then you can look up uh, the Blinkstein ID zone file, that's the domain, and within that zone file, it'll contain entries uh, pointing to other zone files. So here, um, this zone file has two subdomains defined, uh, one for Aaron and one for Tom, uh, and both of those zone files are just strings like they were before. So how does this look um, when you try to implement this uh, in the client? So, oh, no, my slides changed. Okay, so uh, the properties that you actually get uh, from owning a subdomain are a little bit different than the properties that you would get from owning a domain. So the similarities are that uh, subdomains are still owned by the end user. What this means is that if you're trying to like update your zone file, let's say your storage changes, um, then only the user's private key is actually able to issue that update. Um, so this is just like domains where, um, yeah, you can have a Bitcoin address, like a multi-sig address or something like that. It's actually responsible for managing the name. 
However, the trade-off that you get here that you don't experience if you own a domain is that the domain operator can censor those updates. Um, this is because ultimately the domain operator uh, is controlling what goes in to that uh, outer zone file. Um, so it can ignore your updates or even ignore a registration. All right, so now uh, let's look at how it's actually implemented. So uh, here, if you're trying to register a subdomain, um, you have your client. It talks to um, a subdomain registrar service. Um, you say, please register me. This is where the censorship attack comes into play. Um, this subdomain registrar is uh, receiving requests from many different users. Um, it waits some amount of time, and then it updates its zone file to tell the world that, like, hey, there's these new subdomains. Wait. So um, one of the big benefits that you see here is that the registrar is able to batch these registrations so that it can include many of them within a single transaction. Um, that way, um, rather than uh, one registration requiring three transactions, you can have something like 20 registrations requiring only one transaction. Um, the second uh, benefit here is that this uh, reduces the transaction fees a ton. So um, one transaction fee for 20 transactions is actually uh, a whole lot less money than uh, three transactions for one registration. So um, if we look at the improvements, one is it's faster to register because uh, it can be done as quickly as one block uh, if the registrar batches all these updates together and issues a new update to its zone file every 10 minutes, then the registrations can actually go through super fast. Um, the second benefit is that it's cheaper in aggregate. So at 20 subdomains per transaction fee, that works out to about $1. Um, so it's about 1 40th of the cost uh, to onboard a new user. Um, the last benefit is that it's also uh, much more easily subsidized by a registrar because all of the uh, transactions are actually going through um, that registrar process. Um, so this is supported today uh, somewhat. Uh, so our uh, resolvers uh, and indexers uh, actually already understand uh, subdomains. Um, so there's one subdomain registrar uh, one subdomain registered, that was me, um, you can go to this website in your browser and it'll, it'll do the resolution. Um, and you can see it, it turns a zone file into an actual profile. Um, we have a prototype resolver code, which is already living in Blockstack Core. Um, there's some documentation which talks about um, how we actually achieve the security properties uh, of subdomains. And we're working on testing and deploying our own subdomain registrar now. Uh, to support quicker user registrations. Um, okay, so uh, now that I've given you a sort of high-level overview of what uh, subdomains are and what we hope to achieve with them, uh, I'm going to have a demo that uh, I haven't tested yet, so fingers crossed. Let's see. So what I'm gonna do is I have a, a Bitcoin testnet running on my computer that Bitcoin testnet uh, has some initial block stack transactions already written to it. And then it also has a subdomain registrar uh, up and running, accepting uh, registration requests and trying to write them into my testnet. Um, so let's see if that's working. Let's see. Okay, so here uh, you have. Uh, Oh yeah, Emacs doesn't want to zoom today, but if you look uh, very closely, um, I have a uh, test scenario set up and running. So we have an integration test framework which will spawn a test net and then uh, do the requisite transactions to get our network uh, up and running. And then also spawn a subdomain registrar. Now, uh, when I switch shells, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna register a new subdomain and then try to look it up a little bit later. Let's see. Oh yeah, good idea, Jude.
That's too big. So what I have here is a curl command, um, which is just going to issue a, a REST request um, to my subdomain registrar. So the data that I'm setting it is this JSON blob, which defines a zone file, the subdomain name that I'm going to try to register, uh, and an owner address. Uh, the zone file string uh, basically just says that the uh, the name that we're concerned with is Baz, um, and the URI that you can find the profile at uh, is a file that's living in my temp directory right now, uh, which is actually also a JSON blob. Um, and then uh, if you look at the owner address, you can see it's a Bitcoin address. Let's see uh, what happens. So now I'm gonna fire this command at, at my registrar. And I get a message uh, back which says that the subdomain registration has been queued. So what the registrar is going to do is it's going to wake up um, every uh, few blocks and issue a batch of updates. In this case, the batch is only going to contain uh, one update. So if I check on the status uh, of this name, I get a message that uh, my subdomain was registered in some uh, transaction ID, and it should propagate on the network once it has uh, about six confirmations. Um, since I'm running uh, on my test net, uh, six confirmations uh, should take about 30 seconds. So let's, uh, let's try to pull it and see whether or not the lookups are succeeding. Okay, so uh, what I do here is um, I'm curling uh, for baz.foo.id uh, from my local resolver node, and then it returns uh, basically the information that I was expecting, that uh, this name is associated with this particular address, it was uh, registered on the Bitcoin blockchain, um, the transaction ID corresponds to the transaction ID it was registered in, and then it also has this zone file um, which I can then uh, later use to resolve uh, the zone file into a profile. 